Good morning. It's got about 10 30. It's time to begin our Sunday morning worship services here at Cedar Grove. It's good to see each and every one of you today on this beautiful Lord's Day. Thank you for choosing Cedar Grove to come and worship this morning. Our order of worship today, our song leader will be Brother Monty Russell, and our first song will be number 54. 54. Our opening prayer this morning will be by Brother Curtis Thomason. And in closing prayer by Brother Harry Smith. The Lord's table this morning will be by Brother Larry Terman. And I will have our scripture reading at the appropriate time also. On our sick list, we have several announcements to pass along. Sister Aldi Mae Thomason fell last night and she broke her right wrist along with a rib. Please pray for her. She is now at home and recovering. Sister Sheila Brace will begin her cancer treatments last Monday, and so far, everything seems to be going very well. Pat Greenwald's MRI has been rescheduled for September the 13th. Cliff Sowell will be having tests done in Dothan on Tuesday, September 6th, and on the 13th. Glenda Simmons continues to recover at home from a broken collarbone. She saw her doctor on Thursday and will have to wear her arm in a sling for two more weeks and will then have a CT scan done. She is still in a lot of pain. Larry Harrison is still taking physical therapy and recovering from surgery along with other issues, but he is doing much better and it's good to see him here with us this morning. Sammy Sutton's radiation treatments were postponed again last week. Also remember Linda Kyle as she continues to take chemo and radiation for her cancer at this time. Uh, we're happy to announce today that we have a new sister in Christ. Maddie O'Connor was baptized last Monday night by our brother Kyle Ray Thomason. Maddie is Kay Green's girlfriend, and she's right back there sitting beside Kay. We always like to point that out. Uh, but we're very, very proud of Maddie and happy to have her as a new sister in Christ. The elders and deacons will be meeting this afternoon at 3 o'clock in the church annex. Cedar Grove will participate in the Operation Christmas Joy Panama Shoebox Mission again this year. There are lists on the table in the foyer for items that you can purchase for the boxes. These items can be placed on a table in the church annex. You can also give a monetary donation to Abby Thomason. All purchased items and monetary donations must be in by next Sunday, September the 11th. The monthly ladies Bible class will be collecting monetary donations during the month of September and also in October. And this is for the Coats for Kids project. These donations can be given to Sharon Dye or Hazel McLean. The first ladies Bible class meeting will be on September the 12th at 6 o'clock in the church annex. The weekly Digging Deeper ladies Bible class will meet on Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. in the church library. We are in the process of updating our members' email addresses. If you have not already done so, please list your present email address on the sign-up sheet on the table in the foyer, and this will allow the church uh, for you to get the church bulletin as well as other church-related news so that that can be emailed to you. There's also a sign-up sheet for those that want to be a part of the evangelism class. This takes place on Wednesday nights, which will be taught by Brother Curtis Thomason and Brother Ethan Hicks. And that will begin on Wednesday, September the 14th. There's also another sign-up sheet for those who, will, who want to take part in the Chili Cook-Off, the first annual Chili Cook-Off. This will take place on Saturday, September the 24th, beginning at noon. There will be three local judges for the Chili Competition, and there will be awards for first, second, and third place winners. For those that don't make chili, we will need toppings for the chili, which will include crackers, drinks, I'm sorry, we'll need toppings for the chili along with crackers, drinks, and desserts. So we're looking forward to the chili cook-off again that's September the 24th at noon here at the church. Next Sunday, September the 11th, there will be a back-to-school bash for the youth. This will take place at the home of Jed and Heather Blackwell. This will begin, as I said, at noon in the morning, following the morning services here at church. Lunch will be provided along with swimming, volleyball, Cornhole and a devotion led by Brother Trent Bailey. All youth and youth parents are invited. If you have any questions, please see Jed or Heather. Don't forget our services this afternoon at 5 o'clock. Also on Wednesday night at 6.30, we'll be having our monthly singing. I have a few cards to share with you real briefly before we turn the services over to Monty. 
First card says, Thank you so much for all the cards, calls, texts, and prayers the last few weeks. I am truly blessed to have my Cedar Grove family. Love, Cindy Martin. The next card says, We'd like to express our deepest gratitude for the kindness you've shown over the past weeks. We appreciate everyone's prayers, cards, calls, and visits, as well as every gift and food, the, flower, the flowers, and the miles that people have driven on our behalf. You opened your heart and lightened our lighten our load and we are beyond blessed. Thank you very much, Glenda Simmons and Christy Sasser. Are there any more announcements to pass along this morning? If not, again, thank you for being here. We'll turn our services over to Brother Monty at this time. Thank you. <coughs> Number 54. 54. Holy, 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 Lord.
again after this, we'll have our opening prayer. for each member and for each one that is involved in the work here. We pray that you bless all the efforts for good and that much can be accomplished, especially that we may reach out to others and lead them to Christ and have them become your children. We pray this morning that you would forgive us for our sins and help us to enter into this worship in a, with clean mind and heart. We pray that you would be with us in the future, that we would strive to live as close to your word as, as possible. We pray this morning that you would bless all those that are sick and the ones that have been mentioned and others that would have an interest in our prayers, that you would bless them and that our, we might do the things that we can to encourage and help them. We thankful, Father, for our minister. We pray that you would bless him as he studies and that he presents the truths to us that we need. And we pray for thanksgiving for that. We ask you now to continue with us in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To better prepare our minds for the taking of the Lord's Supper, let's sing number 371. 371. The first and third verses. Number 371. <clears throat>
through the vine, the bread, the vine, through the vine. Raise your hand and someone will bring you one if you need one. Come to this time of our worship, as we as Christians upon the first day of the week commanded to take the Lord's Supper. I find it interesting that Christ, before He was betrayed and arrested, He went to the garden to pray. And leaving the garden, that's when the arrest took place. Of course, the events leading up to that, uh, you want to take time at your convenience. John chapter uh, 16 and 17, we find where Christ uh, prayed. He prayed several times, and He prayed not only for His disciples, but He prayed also for uh, the future of the church that was going to be established, the kingdom that He was bringing to this earth. And I'm going to read some passages one of the things I find most interesting in these prayers is he prayed for oneness. He prayed that his disciples would be one. He prayed for those that were going to be converted through the word that he had given them would be one. He also prayed for them to be kept from the world, which is the evil, because they were going out into the world. And it's the same for us today. We are in this world, but we're not of this world. When you become a Christian, you're baptized into Christ, and you become that faithful Christian. Now you are part of that glorious kingdom, the church, Christ established. You're in this world, but we're not of this world. And that's what we have to remember as Christians. But I want you to notice the prayer he prayed to be glorified. In, verse, in chapter 17 of John, he says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify Thou me with Thine own self, with the glory which I had with Thee before the world was. This teaches us some things here about Christ in this prayer. He was in the beginning with God. And then He came to this earth to be the ultimate example, the sacrifice for you and I, and to establish the church, the kingdom which we have today. And in this prayer... He prays, glorify me that the work that I have done might glorify thee, the Father. Christ was always wanting to do God's will. But he knew as a man he was going to have to go and suffer the cross. And he did not want to do that. He had a, he had a kind of a war. The spirituality of, of him that existed because he was God in the flesh. And then the human side of him, folks, he did not want to die. But he knew he must and so he went to the cross. He suffered there for you and I. Shed his blood that we might have the hope of eternity if we do his will. To take part in this death, burial, and resurrection that he established with his disciples the night before his crucifixion. And that is to take this bread, which is his body, and to take this cup which is his blood that was suffered and shed for each of us. If you will, bow with me as we pray for the bread that we're about to partake. Father in heaven, we're truly grateful for this day. We thank you for this opportunity we have as Christians to assemble at this place. We pray, Father, that we think about what Christ did for each and every one of us and going to that cross, shedding his blood, establishing the plan of salvation, the hope of eternity with you one day, Father. We thank you for allowing him to come suffer and die and to be raised from the dead and he's at the right hand of the father for us today and father we pray now that as we partake of this bread represents your son's body pray that we do so in a well-pleasing manner in christ's name we pray amen
bow again to offer thanks for this cup. Likewise, Father, we thank you for this cup which represents Christ's blood that was shed at the cross for us. We pray, Father, that as we as Christians partake of this this morning, that we think back to what Christ give. He give his all for each of us. He shed that blood that we might have the remission of our sins and the hope of eternity. In Christ we pray. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we uh, offer this opportunity for you to lay by in store, for you to give as you've been prospered. Uh, as you notice, there's a basket on the table in the foyer. If you, were not, if you did not have opportunity to do so, you can as you exit, but uh, we, uh, we do that so that uh, we can continue the work of the church in this location. But if you get our monthly bulletin, uh, the, the City Grove Church here is, through the years has been very supportive of missions and all types of uh, uh, work, benevolence, and it's great because that's what we're commanded to do. And uh, I think our elders uh, do an outstanding job in leading us and helping us and, and doing and offering these things that we can, we can uh, see the results of hopefully people being converted. But uh, let us pray and offer, and offer thanks for these monetary blessings. Father, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for allowing us to be able to earn uh, a living and, and earn, have jobs so that we can uh, earn a pay. And Father, we pray that if we, uh, we give back, uh, to you, we give back that portion that is so rightly deserved that we do with cheerful hearts that the work here at, at this location may continue. Bless our efforts, bless our families, bless those uh, uh, that work and, and do these things. And we're so thankful, Father, for all you give us in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. He will mark number 886 as a song of invitation, number 886. 886. And then turn to number 521. Number 521. We'll sing this before Brother Trent comes and speaks to us. All who wish, stand, please. Number 5. Scripture reading for this morning's lesson will be taken from the book of Psalm, chapter 28, or I'm sorry, Psalm 28, verses 6 and 7. Psalm 28, verses 6 and 7. Blessed be the Lord, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. 
The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song I will praise him. Good morning, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here today at Cedar Grove Church of Christ. If you have your hymnals, turn to number 374. 374, we'll sing all five verses of A Beautiful Life before we dive into our sermon this morning. 374. Each day I'll do according to my helping those who are in need. My life on earth is but a span, and so I'll do the best I can. Life's evening sun.
try to live some traveler's load. I'll try to turn the night to day, make flowers bloom along the way. Life's evening sun is sinking low. days and I must go to meet the deeds that I have done where there will be no setting sun. Amen. As I mentioned this morning in our class, it is such a beautiful day this morning as we come together and worship the Lord in love and in spirit and in truth. This is a great family that we have here, brothers and sisters in Christ that come together to worship the Lord and look at what the Lord has to say and to apply it to our lives. We're very blessed uh, and everywhere that you look from our eldership to our deacons to our our staff to all those that teach class and to the parents here with the children and and all ages as we come together to fight the good fight to lift each other up. Tomorrow is a holiday that has been around for a while believe it or not. It's called Labor Day. Now, when I say the word labor, probably not so good uh, feelings or not so good images come to your mind. You know, work has kind of had a bad reputation or a hard reputation with what we have been doing for a long time, regardless of how old we are. We've all worked at some time or another. But Labor Day, the holiday, pays tribute to the contributions and achievements of the American worker. It was created by the later labor movement in the late 19th century and became a federal holiday in 1894. Some of you, if not most of you, um, are off tomorrow if you do have a job or there are some jobs that they don't exactly uh, adhere to certain off days as holidays and such. But it is important that all of us consider what work is. And that is what we're going to look at this morning. What is work? And what does the Bible have to say about work? Did you know that the word work was first mentioned in Genesis chapter 2, all the way back? In creation, all the way back before the fall of man, we have God himself. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Church work is a good thing. And we know this for one reason is that God himself works. We see that even before the fall, here in Genesis chapter 2 verse 3, before the curse of Adam that we will see shortly, that there was work and God does work and he's been working ever since. Ever since creation, God has been busy at work. We see all throughout the Bible, the work of God, the work of the Lord, the work of Jesus Christ, the work of the Spirit. God cannot do anything wrong. God cannot do anything that is unloving. He cannot do anything that's a mistake. Whatever God does is right. Whatever God does is true. Whatever God does is correct. So does that mean that God is doing wrong when he works? Absolutely not. We could also see that Adam had a job. Adam was busy at work. Also in Genesis chapter 2, verse 20, it says, So Adam gave names to all cattle, 
to all the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. So even before the creation of Eve, when there was just Adam and there were the other animals, God gave him work. God gave him a job. He was and had something to do. What was he doing? He was naming the cattle. He was naming the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But, you know, a lot of times we think, oh, work, work, work is bad, bad, bad. But this is when the earth was perfect. This is when the universe was perfect. Now, you might be saying, okay, Trent, well, you know, what about the curse of Adam? Let's look at that for a moment. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, we see the curse of Adam. Now we think, and if you're like me, I've thought for many years that, you know, Adam did not have to work before the curse. Well, there was work, but the conditions of work is what was cursed. It says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the the ground, for out of it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. In the curse of Adam and, you know, uh, the curse that we have even today, no, not because we have original sin, but because the change, things change here with the fall of man, now the conditions were hard. Now the conditions were sometimes unsuccessful. Now the things, there was problems in the world. Now there was fighting and disagreements. Now there was sin and how sin relates to our work. Now was difficulty when it came to work. So this morning as we look and consider how work is not exactly all terrible and all bad, we can see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, a point and many points that Paul gives us. We're going to look at that verse for the rest of the morning. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. We're going to be looking there momentarily. But before we do, I want to mention, and all of us look at Scripture, and we say, okay, what are some good qualities, some good characteristics about different people. Well, being a hard worker is a great characteristic. We know in Proverbs chapter 31, the virtuous woman, and even in verse 13, it says she seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. To be a virtuous woman is a woman that is hardworking. And to be a, a man that has a good character is a man that works hard. But also, you know, work doesn't exactly mean having a secular job or a job where you get paid or even a a job that maybe people know about. You might be saying, okay, well, I'm retired. I haven't had a job in in a long time or I'm not able to work at this time. Well, we are still able to work for the Lord and to be busy for God. You know, we think of Jesus Christ himself, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And in John chapter 21, verse 25, we see that, you know, working doesn't exactly and only mean that it's a job. And there are also, John 21, 25, it says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Let's talk about how busy Jesus was when he was here on earth, especially in those three years of his evangelism, in his teaching, in his spreading the gospel, in his preaching, in his doing good work. 
In those three years, he didn't exactly have a, a specific secular job, but was he busy? Was he working? Absolutely. So much so that we only see a glimpse of what he was doing in Scripture. Because as John 21 verse 25 says, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written if everything was written about what Jesus did. Church, our life should be like that as well. Are we active? You know, or are we simply existing and, and waiting to die? Are we being busy for the Lord? You know, regardless of our age, we can always be doing something, and this is very good. This is a blessing. God works, Jesus worked, and so should we. So let's look at the main passage of the morning, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Now there's a popular verse that all of us have heard of right there smack dab in the middle, verse 10. But we're going to look a few verses before that, and we're also going to look at a few verses after that. It's really good to get the whole context about what is being spoken here. 2 Thessalonians, a letter, an epistle, being written to the church of Thessalonica. It says, but we command you, brethren, this is Paul talking, but we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we are not disorderly among you. Church, at this time, there were some other traditions that were being popular. One was the Greek influence. And unfortunately, the Greek influence was not good and was coming into the church. There was a mentality of the Greeks that only the slaves would work. If you're a slave, you worked. And if you were not a slave, you did not work. So what they did is that if you're not of the slave class, they would sit around, literally sit around and do philosophy. They would, you know, concentrate only on the arts, concentrate only on pleasure. That was one tradition. That was not a good tradition. Also, another tradition that was going on is that there were many beggars. And there would be beggars that would follow rich people. And whenever they were done, they would simply uh, try to work for them or try to appease these rich people and make them feel good so they would give them a tip. And he, he's saying that that is disorderly. But there was also another tradition and another skewing of the teaching of Christ where they said, okay, well, you know, I don't need to work because... You know, Christ is coming back, so I need to focus only about the important stuff. I only, I only need to be spoken about uh, spirituality. I don't need to be busy on this, on this earth whatsoever. I don't need to have a job. I don't need to work. And all three of those are mistaken. They're all incorrect. In verse 8, it says, Nor did we eat anybody's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you not because we do not have authority but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us we know that paul received charity we know that jesus and the apostles received charity received contributions so we know that it is not wrong to accept those things but here Paul is saying that he did work, one, to be an example, but also not to be a leech, not to be a burden to the church and to these people. We also see, and it's very important, back up in verse 6, it says, We command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, not to be in close fellowship with them. Why? Because laziness is contagious. Laziness is passed around. You'll see maybe where you have a, a family line even of hard workers. And you could see how it goes from the grandfather to the, to the or grandmother to the, to the kids, to the grandkids, and so on and so forth. But you could also see the other way around. You see, laziness spread. Laziness leads to more laziness. And that can be passed around 
unfortunately. Paul was a worker because Jesus was a worker, as we saw in verse 9. He had the authority, but he wanted to make himself as an example. Verse 10, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. The issue of laziness and the issue of people not working was starting to be such a problem that he took it to the extreme and took it to the negative. You know, usually in other epistles, Paul is lifting people up, but not right here. He's saying, if anyone would not work, neither shall he eat. Verse 11, for we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are Busy bodies. Laziness, idleness, leads to other problems. That's one reason why it is such a problem. One thing that idleness leads to is being a busybody. You know, we as human beings need to be active some way or another. And if we're not active in the Lord, then we are active in the world. You know, it's kind of like all of us have a vial of liquid, and then we have two other cups, one of the world, one of the Lord, and we're pouring our liquid in either the Lord's cup or in the world's cup. You can't separate it. You know, you can't do half and half. It's either all going one or the other. So which one are we pouring our life into? Or are we pouring our life into godly work? And to be busy for the Lord and being productive just as Adam was, just as Jesus was, just as Paul was, and just as we should today? Or are we idling? Are we disorder? Are we simply a feather in the wind and just seeing what will happen? Or maybe even being a burden to other people as he warns against in verse 8. Let's read on, verse 12. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. We should continue to work hard. We should continue to do the work of the Lord. We should continue to labor in the Lord, regardless of what our spouse is doing, regardless of what our parents are doing, our kids, regardless of what other people at the church are doing or not doing, whatever happens in town or or anywhere else for that matter. We should not grow weary. We should keep on Keep it on. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now you might be looking at this passage and saying, my goodness, this guy's having a bad day. This is, is he blowing this out of proportion? You know, he's talking about people that aren't working, people that aren't being busy. Absolutely not, of course, because this is inspired scripture. Paul is talking about how idleness and treading water and not doing anything leads to some terrible things. We see there that it could even lead to hurting others, and it could also lead to sin. You know. I don't think it's an accident. That when we are busy working for the Lord, we're happier. I don't think it's an accident when we are busy working for the Lord, we're helping others. And it's not an accident that when we are busy working, period, you know, we're able to do more things. We're able to be more charitable. We're able to uh, be a good example. We're also able to learn more. This is something that we would disagree with, maybe the Catholic monastery concept, where they go around, they go out and they lead, they they don't do work, they don't participate in the community, they lock themselves in a room and only read the Bible. Well, I don't see that here in Second Thessalonians. 
I see us going out into the world, having an income, having a job, being productive, helping others, lifting other people up. Isn't that what Jesus Christ did in the three years of his ministry? Absolutely. So I recommend all of us to see what we can do. And as I mentioned earlier, if we are retired, that doesn't mean that we've hung up our hat, we've clocked out. That means we've just changed jobs. That means we've transitioned roles. We all know people of those that are, are maybe later in life, that are very busy for the Lord, that are very busy and doing good things. But frankly, we also know people that probably when I said the word laziness earlier, you saw them in your mind, unfortunately. So as we leave here, I recommend all of us to work and do the best that we can in every aspect of our life, and that includes our job, that includes our work, that includes our school, that includes our yard work, that includes our visit with friends and family, that includes calling others, that includes being a part of maybe a, a, a civic club, that a, Includes so on and so forth. Maybe being a a coach of a little league team. The list goes on. Be busy for the Lord. But we must remember in anything that we do, do it for the glory of who? For God. You know, America has always been known as being a hard-working nation, having a good work ethic. Where does that come from? That comes from the pilgrims, and since then, as a Christian nation, to be a Christian does not mean to be lazy. To be a Christian does not mean to be a busybody. To be a Christian does not mean to be a moocher or a leech. A Christian is a hard worker and good at his labor. Church, this morning, maybe you need prayers. Maybe you've been going through stuff this week and, and you, need a, uh, you need prayers of encouragement. You need love of the church. If there's anything that we can do for you, we have the water. It's ready. If you need to put on Christ in baptism, if there's anything that we could do, if you would please come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. afternoon's worship service at five o'clock if you will turn to number 598 we'll sing the first verse of this and when then we'll be dismissed in prayer number 598 
a common love for each other.